Well, we just saw them. Now let's talk about them. I'm talking about the bold and the beautiful. The bold and the beautiful. That was, that was they right there. But let's talk a little about the bold and the beautiful. I'm not talking about the soap opera. I think there has been one for years called that. I don't think I've ever seen it. I've seen some of them. I've seen some of the long-running ones here and there. But uh, there was one called the bold and the beautiful, I think. Anyway, those were our bold and beautiful kids that just went out, and uh, that they are. But our scripture reading that Drew shared with us this morning talks about the bold and the beautiful. It presents a couple of characters we, that are real, of course, and that we might say the bold and the beautiful characterize the way they are described and used and presented to us by Jesus Himself in this passage. We are, as Patty alluded to, in a series wrapping it up today on prayer. Jesus approached by a disciple of His, one of His disciples, and we looked two Sundays ago at this first verse of Luke 11, a few verses before where Drew started reading today, in which or the verse in which a disciple says, Lord, teach us to pray like John also taught his disciples. So they've observed John the Baptist and his disciples. They apparently had a particular prayer that was kind of community-defining in a way. It was, it was what they did. It was a prayer they had as a group that was known as John the Baptist's disciples. And they had also just observed Jesus praying. After Jesus prayed, then this disciple said, Lord, teach us to pray. So we talked about how there are people in this world whose prayer lives kind of amaze us. We say they've got a direct line to God, different ways of describing that. And we're just motivated to want to be better prayers, not in some kind of performance-oriented way, but just that we know there's a way to have an enriched, uh, even richer than we currently experience perhaps prayer life. And so we're motivated and inspired by folks who have these rich prayer lives, or maybe they go about it a different way than we do. They said, well, like John the Baptist disciples, maybe do it like that. So they were inspired to get better, to enrich their prayer life with God. Ask Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. And we talked about that a couple of weeks ago, praying for a prayer life. When you ask Jesus to help you with your prayer life, you're already praying because talking with Jesus is prayer. Jesus answered, and that was verses 2, 3, and 4 last Sunday. He answered with a condensed version, as we know, an abbreviated form in Luke's Gospel of what we call the Lord's Prayer. Matthew 6 has the longer version we're a little bit more familiar with in terms of how we say it today. They're both basically this, what we now call the Lord's Prayer. And in that prayer, it was a model prayer some, there is some debate over whether Jesus intended for it to be wrote and said over and over and over the same way. There are arguments to be made on both sides. But I think Jesus knew exactly what He was doing when He gave a model prayer, knowing it would be used over and over. Lord, teach us to pray like John's disciples. They've got one of these prayers, you say, over and over. We want one too. And Jesus did not disagree. He thought that was a fine idea. When you pray, say this, Father, hallowed be thy name. And he goes on through what we call the Lord's Prayer. Talked about that some last week. But in giving them that model prayer, knowing the dangers of mindlessly repeating something just because we've heard it all of our lives, he built into it this wording and this meaning that in this phrasing that draws the prayer in to a life of deeper discipleship. And so we talk about making disciples of Jesus Christ. The Lord's Prayer is one of those methods that Jesus has left us with that kind of encourages that consciously and even subconsciously when we pray it. Because as we pray it, it's really one of those dangerous prayers or as some hymns we say have lethal lyrics. In other words, they're really dangerous. We're signing up for heavy commitment when we sing those songs, when we pray those prayers. And in this one, we talked last week how basically in the Lord's Prayer, it's a teaching tool and technique over and over in which we are learning again and again 
to, say, to recognize and surrender to the living God. To recognize and surrender to the living God who is approachable and loving, who is holy and sovereign, and who has His own agenda for our lives. Whoa, that is dangerous, isn't it? And we say, Lord, teach us to pray. Yes, I, here's a prayer. Use this one. And feel free to use it over and over and over because it will help you with discipleship as well as help you in praying because we are recognizing and surrendering to this living God over and over. And then he also builds into it real requests of God for real needs. Make real requests of God that show our dependency on God and that also show that we live expectantly, knowing that He will provide for our needs. Sell out to God, surrender completely to Him, and trust Him to, to meet your needs all along the way. That's the message of the Lord's Prayer. And a beautiful prayer it is. And one that He loves when we pray and when we tune in and mean it as well. And it teaches us the whole way. Well, after that, the passage continues in what Drew read today. It's really a longer portion of the passage, but it kind of feels like an addendum after you've focused on the Lord's Prayer for a few verses. We are in that time of year when we emphasize not the Christmas cycle of the Scripture passages and worship elements, not the Easter cycle, Advent, Chris, uh, Christmas, Epiphany, and Lent, Easter, and Pentecost. We're in that half of the year in which we emphasize and hear and consider together what we might call more direct topics of the church, of the kingdom of God, of Christian discipleship as a whole. Specifically, topical kinds of things from the Scriptures that help us to realize we are in this kingdom of God. We are in this church of Jesus Christ. We are these disciples of Jesus Christ. And we're not rehearsing the Christ event in birth and in death and in resurrection so much, or not quite as directly this time of year. Rather, we're kind of living out that so what aspect that follows it. Well, so what is that we're disciples of Jesus Christ. We've signed up. And we're praying that prayer. And we're surrendering anew to the living God. We're trusting Him along the way. Lord, help me to do so more. I believe. Help my unbelief. And so we have questions where we say, do we support the church? Do we demonstrate our discipleship? Do we sign up again and again in the kingdom of God with our prayers, our presence, our gifts, and our service, and our witness, our whole lives, demonstrating that we belong to Him. And so, as we move through this second half of the year, uh, we move toward the fall of the year when we typically talk about things like that, renewing our vows, uh, things like stewardship. And so we're getting ahead, on, ahead of the curve a little, and we're considering that first vow. Prayers, prayers, presents, gifts, and service. And so the last couple of Sundays, and we conclude today, this, this focus upon prayer. Lord, teach me to pray. In this seemingly addendum type uh, collection of verses following the Lord's Prayer, it's all one passage that flows smoothly. But as we move into that portion for this morning for a few moments, we do encounter the bold and the beautiful. The bold and the beautiful. Jesus tells a story, as Patty alluded to, as Drew read for us, about this fellow coming from out of town. They traveled uh, in the cool of the day when they could, and he apparently just kept going. And it got dark, and he kept going, and he kept going, and was watching out for bandits. And he, he finally arrived, and it was midnight. And the host is saying, oh my goodness, I cannot break the... I, I don't want to be an inhospitable host but I'm out of bread. They would bake bread in that day and in that part of the world uh, what they needed for that day. And they would bake it anew and afresh every morning. He had run out of bread. And in a small village, they might know who was baking bread the latest in the day. 
who might tend to have a little left over. And everybody was together on not wanting the village to be known as being inhospitable. And so he didn't want to be an inhospitable guest. He didn't want to give his village a bad name. But it was late. It was midnight. And he knew that his neighbor had a sizable family and had children and had one of those one-room homes. And so you, you hear the little prepared speech when he first calls out to his neighbor. He explains the whole situation in one verse, in a very brief rehearsed speech, asking for bread. May I borrow some bread? I'll give some back to you later. This fellow's coming in. I have no bread. And the man, of course, says, I'm in the bed with my family. I can't get up and do this. This is really bad timing. I'll have to unbar the door. I'll wake up the children, which they were probably getting awakened by then anyway. And then Jesus, of course, follows that parable by the ask, seek, knock admonitions and talking about the giving of good gifts. Well, in the parable, he makes the point that the neighbor, though he will not do this for his friend because he is his friend, he will do it because of his boldness. That's a word that he uses, his boldness. It says persistence in a lot of versions. That's not really the best meaning that is a way that this kind of boldness is demonstrated often is through persistence. But here the emphasis is not on the repeated act, it's on the nature of the act and the situation. And the word shameless goes with it as well. Because of his shameless boldness, his neighbor will get up and supply his need. Not even because he's his friend, but because of his shameless boldness. Now this is part of a passage on prayer. He's just given them a model prayer which would lean toward tradition. It would lean toward structure. It would lean, lean toward repeated use. It would lean toward uh, regular teaching on the subject of prayer, using the Lord's Prayer as an outline, using it in prayer. So there was this traditional and structured answer he had already given. Now he says, be like this, this, this host whose friend comes to him at midnight and the host must go to the neighbor, another friend, and ask for bread. He won't get what he needs simply because he knows the guy, but because he has the nerve, the audacity, the gall, the boldness to ask him to knock on his door at midnight, knowing his family's in the bed and how hard it is to get all the kids back to sleep again. Can I get an amen on that? <laughs> we relate to a passage like that. And that's what gives this passage its charm in many ways. Shameless boldness. Balancing out that model prayer. Shameless boldness. What does that even mean when we apply that to prayer? Well, do you remember when Frank Sinatra commented on the newfound skyrocketing popularity of Elvis Presley? If you don't, let me remind you of it or tell you about it. Frank Sinatra, in an interview described that was asked, of course, by a reporter trying to get a rise out of Frank Sinatra. And he brought up Elvis Presley and how he's just taken over the charts and taken over the country. This was, I guess, the late 50s, mid to late, or late 50s. And in his answer, Frank Sinatra decried and dismissed and criticized Elvis and used the word vulgar in his description. Use the word vulgar. Now, of course, he sw well, they swung his pelvis, I guess. Was what Elvis, that, what they, that didn't help Elvis's case any, but by using the word vulgar, Frank Sinatra was not referring to some obscenity, some indecent exposure, some stream of profanity out of his mouth. None of that had happened. 
It was just this different, emotional, passionate way of performing that was so different and so new to the country. And so unusual. And so abrasive, really. And Frank Sinatra was describing that. And he used the word vulgar because what happened was Elvis Presley was breaking the code that entertainers had with their audiences. And the code had always been up to that time, and Old Blue Eyes was the master of it, was to be cool and coy and aloof and to not show your feelings, to be a little distant. In control. In control. Elvis was out of control. He wasn't trying to be cool or coy or aloof or anything. He was all over the stage like a madman. And they'd ask him afterwards about certain moves and this, that, and the other. And he'd say, I don't know. I don't know. I was just singing. I felt the music. I moved to it. Doesn't everybody do that? Well, no, Elvis, everybody does not do that. This is why you're so unusual. He broke the code. He showed his, he wore his passion on his sleeve. And whatever we think of of Elvis or Frank Sinatra or anybody else, there was that shift, that differentness. It was a shameless boldness, a, almost a vulgarity about it for certain cultural, from certain cultural perspectives. He wore his passion on his sleeve. He acted it out. He moved his body in regard to what he felt. He showed his feelings. Of course, that's talking about pop music and we're talking about prayer. Shameless boldness in prayer. I've given you a model prayer, but lest you get caught up in rote memorization only, let me also encourage you and challenge you, Jesus is saying, to have shameless boldness in prayer. To wear your heart on your sleeve. To show me your feelings. He praised the bold host who was willing to wake his neighbor and endure criticism because he felt so strongly his responsibility to be a good host to this out-of-town traveler who is now coming, this other friend who is coming to him at midnight. He felt so strongly about it. And don't you know he wrestled with that decision? Do I knock on the door or not? Yes, he let his passion lead him into shameless boldness in requesting. And his neighbor, though he wouldn't have done it just out of friendship, he did it out of just the nerve of the guy. And so Jesus says, be shamelessly bold in your prayers. Be emotion driven, be passionate. Wear your heart on your sleeve. I want to know what you're feeling. What are you going through? Bring your heart to my heart. And yes, balance it out with a model prayer, the Lord's Prayer. So He's covering all the bases. That's the bold. There's also the beautiful. The bold and the beautiful. Some parables are ones of comparison. This one is one of contrast when it comes to the God character or to the one who is answering the request. God is the opposite of the neighbor who reluctantly answers the guy at the door. I don't want to help you. Our friendship, though I value it, it's not motivating me enough to get out of bed and wake my children and unbar the door and give you our leftover bread. But because you've got the nerve to disrupt us, I guess I'll give it to you. God is the opposite of that. He's the opposite. He's generous. He's beautiful. He's overflowing in His love and His desire to receive those shamelessly bold prayers from our heart to His heart and to give in return. And not only does Jesus say that He's the opposite of the reluctant neighbor, He goes further, as Patty told the children, and said, He's even better than a really good parent who when a child asks for what they need, asks for an egg or a fish, they don't give him a scorpion or a snake. They give him what they need. 
God's even better than that. If imperfect human beings do that well, if fallen folks do that well, how much greater, and that's the logic of the whole passage, how much greater is God? How great is our God? How much greater does God answer your prayers and give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? So we have the bold and the beautiful. The beautiful God who is so generous and overflowing in love and wants to hear those shamelessly bold prayers because He's got a shamelessly bold heart that He sent His Son into the world for our sins and to redeem us. Well, attention is set up in this passage, is it not? Be shamelessly bold in your prayers. Bring it on. Wear your heart on your sleeve. Be emotion-driven in your prayers. Approach God in this seemingly vulgar way compared to the model prayer I just gave you. Do it too, by the way, he's saying. The bold, passion, heart, emotion, feeling. Bring it all. The beautiful, loving, generous, overflowing. Can't wait to answer our prayers. Jesus anticipates the tension of our concern. How Now we're concerned about abusing this generous God with getting just anything and everything we ask for. We don't know what to ask for most of the time. We don't know what's best for us most of the time. And so we are reminded that this call for the bold to pray to the beautiful is in the context of a Christian disciple, one who's already signed up to follow Jesus Christ and is in fact following Him that asks the question, Lord, teach us to pray. That's the context. We see it at the beginning of the passage and we see at the very end how much more then will your heavenly Father give whatever in the world you happen to ask Him? No. How much more then will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? The Holy Spirit to those who ask Him. God's still on the throne. He knows what's best for us. In the context of a sold-out Christian disciple who knows the greatest gift from God is the Holy Spirit to empower us, to comfort us, to be with us, to teach us from Jesus' heart to ours, to lead us forward, to grow us in His grace. Within this context, be bold, be shamelessly bold. Show your heart. Bring it. Bring your feelings to God. And this beautiful, generous, loving, overflowing God will supply your needs because you're one of those folks who has sold out to follow Him. One of those Christian disciples. I want to invite you to respond with me to this word on prayer from Jesus and that we've been considering in these mornings. Number 885 in your hymnal is an affirmation of faith called a modern affirmation. And it would be compared to ones that are older and more traditional perhaps a little shamelessly bold. So let's be bold this morning and affirm our faith. Let's stand as you find that in your hymnal, number 885, and affirm our faith together. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all His works, and whose will is ever directed to His children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as the divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ 
and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen. Please be seated. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for being with us this day and for being such a beautiful and generous and loving God. And Lord, we do thank you for models of prayer, for the Lord's Prayer. What a way, O oh God, to keep us on track. We thank you for those whose prayer lives inspire and challenge our own. And we thank you for growing us in our own prayer lives. And God, we, as we'll do later in this service, we seek to pray and to live out what we call the Lord's Prayer. And we thank you for that, Lord, keeping us on track. But Lord, we also hear your invitation to be shamelessly bold, to bring you our heart, our feelings, what we're going through, what we really need, what we really need, what we feel like we need, as you help us to sift and sort through it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for being that beautiful God. You've offered yourself for us. And now, oh God, we offer ourselves back to you. Thank you, Lord. We know that one of the ways we do that is by the giving of your tithes and our offerings. Thank you, Lord, that we have something to give. In Christ's name, amen. 